So it's basically 7200 bucks extra that I make in the prime months. The question is going to be how much do I make less in the in the winter month, months, you know? I, and I, I kind of just like, man, that extra 7200 bucks over the course of 12 months. So really it's like I'm making an extra 600 bucks a month potentially, yeah. right? Like damn man, like I don't know. I don't know. I think as a large scale investor, it's not worth your time. When 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 I was broke, I had rich habits. Uh. When I was broke, I had rich habits. Uh. Chandler. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm in the zone. I'm in. Welcome to Master Keys. I'm Neil Andrino. Yeah. This guy's on his phone. He also goes by Chandler Halliburton. That date's right. Good. The like date it. is correct. Oh, we are season two, episode... 20... Oh, man, I had it going so good. I think we're to episode 29. Episode I think we're 29. 29? Yes. There we go. Episode 29. Welcome back. This is back. a podcast talking about real estate, the economy, the markets, wealth creation, coming at it from our, our perspective. Which giant is rate the, hikes. The giant rate hikes. Landlord uh, and realtors, that's, that's who we are. That's what we do in our day-to-day living. So that's how we're approaching all these news stories. Thanks for tuning in. Let's hit it off the hop. Do we want to hit it off the hop? Okay. No, no let's talk no, about no, what no. we're going to talk sec, about today. One sec. Yeah, yeah. one sec. We're going to cover a lot of things today. A lot so of cool stuff. We're going to do some updates. We're going to give some personal updates. I don't know. We have a bunch of stuff going on. Um, and then we're going to get into some news of what's going on, including raid hikes, uh, giant rental hikes, a couple other things going on, metaverse growth. Um, and then our main topic for today is Airbnb. Yeah. I've switched over a few. Chandler has a few. And we want to talk about kind of what numbers we're seeing. I think it's going really well. I'm going to encourage a bunch of you guys. I'll go over the numbers of what we're making. And then, uh, yeah, that'll be at the end. So stay tuned because it, it's I'm really I'm less enthused on it. Chandler's less enthused. And that's enthused. not intentionally contrarian. I just, I'm a little less enthused. I'm a little more Neil. enthused. Um, so anyways, we'll get into it. And then there's uh, this big looming item of the giant rate hike. But oh. before we get into that, I just want to say again for everyone, thanks for listening. And also thanks for saying hi. Um, yeah. I was out at the bar last weekend. And yeah, I think three or four of you guys came up and said hi, which was super awesome. Um, if I said something in my drunken stupor, I apologize. But again, really appreciate you guys coming up and saying hi. That's mm-hmm. awesome. So that's great. What bar was it? Uh, Yacht Club. Oh, the Yacht so, Club. So Yacht Club. Shout out Yacht Club. Shout out to the boys. Yeah. Scott McLean, Justin Lewis, and all the crew and Dave. Um, you know what? I'll actually, I'll dive in this right off the hop. I was going to mention this at some great. point. Um yeah, Yacht Club doing great. Um, this guy came up to me at the grocer. Yep. Um, and he's like, you know, en- enjoy the podcast. And we had a really interesting conversation where he effectively said for the first time in his life, he's shopping. Meaning he's looking at price tags. He's comparing like, should I get this? Should I got that? Like, wh- what is this compared to what I used to pay for it? And we got in this conversation how... That's a bad thing to say, Ref. He should have been doing that his whole life. You say that, but you know what? You go and you buy your same bundle of goods and you're used to just throwing them in, you know, in, in the what's it called? shopping cart. <laughs> you know, you just throw Chandler them in the cart. Chandler does a lot of shopping, as you can tell. Um, Shout out, Lana. But then <laughs> then we also got into this idea that um, certainly my mother has always shopped that way. Um, you know, she, she was one of the biggest advocates of what's now Costco was at the time Price Club. She like, I went there and I bought like, 40 pounds of chicken breasts, you know, and they'd sit in the freezer for all this time because that was the best deal. And still to this day, she will buy stuff that's on sale and coupons and go to different places because different ones have better pricing. And I'm very guilty. And I think a lot of our generation is very guilty of, you know, I'm just going to throw it in the cart. And this guy who's, you know, probably the same age as me, like in his thirties, was like, yeah, I feel now I'm actually going to be shopping in, in a frugal way because this is, you know, everyone's complaining about inflation, especially food inflation, which is a huge issue. That's the one that really gets people riled up, um, but not necessarily changing their habits. Like people are going to I'm have gonna, to change their habits. I'm going to pipe my horn, but I always, I was a psycho about price shopping. Really? Always. Okay. I've always been a nut bar about it. Yeah, and it's, it's just a good habit, man. It's a good habit. Well, it adds up so fast. I'm like, if I can save 20 bucks on my checkout weekly, that's a hundred bucks a month or 25 bucks a week. It's a hundred bucks a month. It's $1,200 a year. $1,200, you can go on a weekend trip. And I'm like, mm-hmm. that's how I value it. And so for me to make a little bit of effort to do that, it, it made sense. Um, I will say I became guilty as businesses grew of not doing it as much because I was like, mm-hmm. I've price shopped so aggressively my whole life. I've really dictated what I ate every day based on what the cost was. And now I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to eat whatever I want. I've also gone back to price shopping because I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like some of the prices are extortion, like literal yeah. extortion. So I'm like, okay. But it's, it's interesting to hear that 
people who have never done it are starting to like, oh, maybe yeah. I should. And again, I'm, we're back to what we said a few months ago, but the shelves, they kind of refill, but not. they never really, like, the grocery stores for the last, like, six months have just been consistently teetering on, like, missing stuff. I find yeah. every time I go, there's always a few things that are missing. When we said it there, what was it, maybe three months ago, four months ago, it never actually fully came back to being normal. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like we picked up, we caught up a little bit. The chip aisle refilled because Lay's and, like, Loblaws were able to sign an agreement. But everything else is still always missing. Like, I went to go pick up some stuff for a recipe two nights ago, and two of the ingredients I couldn't find. And I yeah. was like, oh, this is weird. Like, I've never, in my head, I've always just been like, okay, I need yeah. this. I just go to the store, and they have that. Yeah, and there's some stuff. Like, you can find these uh, food price indexes where they chart, like, individual items and, like, how much more expensive strawberries are this year than last mm-hmm. or how much more expensive apples are. And some of this are uh, things like drought and, and, and stuff that, that – changes and then there's world supply there's also something that i i don't want to get into it in this episode but i strongly encourage people to google this look up uh farmers netherland because we talked a little bit about this and how expensive it is to be a woke environmentally friendly you know <clears throat> renewable resource country and how you know that is incredibly expensive and yep. it drives the cost of stuff through the roof yep um that's coming to the farming industry right now everyone really associates it with uh, oil and gas prices. Um, the switch to alternative um, resources, it's going to be a very expensive process and it's going to be really, it's going to have major impacts. But food is another one because another major producer of carbon are these synthetic fertilizers. Yep. And all of these you know, governments who are trying to push this agenda of, um, you know, greener um, mandates, it is going to be really hard on the on the farming industry so we already have this massive food inflation issue it's going to get significantly worse because they effectively just told farmers in the netherlands that you can't have cattle it's going to be virtually impossible to have mm-hmm. cattle um because of the carbon footprint and this is you know beyond, that, that, this all sounds like, but, the, but this mm. well this is what people are saying like you know there's certain groups that feel people shouldn't be eating cows period yeah, how much money is beyond me delicious. rallying towards like they're pushing so much on that campaign yeah but man some of these other things like soy is not exactly great for the environment either like when you clear cut these fields it's, it's all finger pointing left and right but Which we have sexier. a problem with the cost like there's a reason we eat so much beef pork and chicken one it's delicious two it's really economical for feeding large numbers of people yep and if we make it no longer economical like things are bad enough as it is from a food inflation standpoint good good thing though if you like chicken nuggets i don't know what the company is actually called but they're called nugs and they're based off like a pea protein i don't know if anyone's had them they're not actually chicken they're pretty freaking good (laughs) pretty freaking good so that's a saving grace the beyond meats improved a lot but i mean yeah, to, to your main point of prices are going crazy and they're only going to go crazier. And then to be slapping on new restrictions and rules to make it even more difficult to produce at a low cost, it's going to continue to perpetuate that issue, which is why I'm like, guys, this have to, everyone has to think for a second. Like, it's amazing. But like, if you rally for all the like environmental things and all the uh, like better health things at the same time as what we're actually having as an issue, like on logistics and overall inflation issues, mm-hmm. it's going to end up costing so much money. Totally. That everyone's going to end up in the poorhouse. Yeah. This is like, we didn't want our discussion of um, basic income, um, you know, and we don't want this discussion to be sort of viewed as anti basic income or, 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 you know, maybe. I'm not totally in favor of that theory, I was but like say, you uh, know, but but this idea, obviously, everyone you know in a perfect world is going to have a living wage that they they can survive, of course, and you know, ideally, we would take steps towards not polluting our planet, but we have to be realistic about the economics and how damaging it's going to be to those exact same people if we try to push these things where food goes through the roof, inflation goes through the roof, to just you, you willy nilly wish stuff. for something, to wish for a rainbow that causes catastrophic issues to other places like it's it's not that simple yeah you can't do blanket blanket items like like the basic income thing like we the way it's being proposed right now where it's like everybody gets it it makes no sense yeah Uh, like i think we're all for helping people in need that require it but giving it to everybody is what they did with serb and take a look at how that went well it's and it's it's hard to even get into an argument or in the weeds on it because it's such a hypothetical ridiculous it's a a high level idea right now it's not boiled out there's not like anything set in stone totally it's Um, not gonna happen either anyways let's get back to our agenda yeah. 
you do the news first. Usually I do my news first. You do yours. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I can hop all over over the map here. I feel like the elephant in the room, though, is that I was wrong. I said 75 basis points. That was where conventional wisdom was at. That's what everyone was saying. The Bank of Canada rate, by the time you hear this, this will be slightly old news, but they jacked rates by 100 points. Do you remember the guy named Neil that was bitching that to go up 200 points to catch your variable rate against your fixed rate might not be that far-fetched? <laughs> Look at this guy all happy with himself. <laughs> smiling. Um, I, I'm not smiling because I got some variable money and like I just went for a renewal and I was at 3.49 or 3.74 and the cheapest option on that new sheet they sent me for my renewal is like 5.69 or something on fixed. like a one year or a two year. Or if I wanted like a three year, I think it was like 6.39 or 6.49 and I was like, holy Jesus. And like the payment went from... Thirteen hundred to two thousand and twenty dollars or something. Wow. No, maybe not thirteen. Yeah. Fifteen hundred. But I, still, that's a thirty-five percent price increase on it. But you were so, also pro, like just rip the band-aid, jack those rates up, and let's get it over with. I'm not. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that they should be increasing the rates that fast. Um, I'm just more so like, I think they're going to be going nuts with this. Like just when you look at the level of inflation, the level of increases on the prices, the level and everything going on. Oh, God. They are going... And this is why I'm like... Eh, I can't believe I don't, they I don't think it. they're just trying to cool inflation. I think they're trying to go a little harder than that. Like... What? I, like, I like forcing a recession. Like, I think they're trying to force a recession, not just... I don't think they're... I, I don't think they're uh, trying to take the inflation curve and just go, oh, and we're all good now, everybody. I, it's going to be a full pullback. I can't imagine any world that they're trying to force an inflation... Or uh, a recession. I think they're just saying, if a recession is what it takes to get inflation under control... That's what we're going to do. Um, you have too much faith in humanity. Why There's, would they force a recession for no because, reason? Because, man, whatsoever. The, the, on the top end, the amount of like people with big money involved, like that understand what's coming down the pipe and everyone's sitting on the sidelines and making investments accordingly. Look at who makes the most money in recessions. It's always, always okay. like the top okay. conspiracy episode one coming to ten percent. Yeah. And they will you want to talk about rallying and, and lobbying mm. and like having control. Like, you don't think that all these giant billion-dollar companies don't have some say on what goes on in these kinds of pushes at the end of the day? But what's what's the alternative, man? Like, And, and I was talking with well, someone Well, like, online. more gradual rate hikes, but just consistently yeah. doing them, right? Uh, I don't know. I This is... I feel so torn about this, because on the one hand, I love that they did it, because I think it's ballsy, and um, I just kind of like it. I don't know why my, this, I get a sick pleasure out of it. On the other hand, I'm like... Oh my God! I've got variable products. That is going to sting. Whether you have variable or fixed too, you're, this is going to sting everywhere. Well, fixed. Your, How could your, you be down your, for this? You have so much money on like our whole I'm business not, is leverage. I know. I'm not, I'm not down for it, but I kind of respect that they did it. I also feel like um, the only way we're going to get past this is to, to we do have to slow things. This really down. takes everyone's portfolios and just cuts like a fucking oh, oh my Jesus God, that's that, a but big that just cuts like fifteen percent off your whole portfolio's value. Just overnight. Oh my god. Um the other thing is I'm so shocked right now. I'm 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 so shocked. Chandler was this. screaming before the mic went on, so we quickly turned the mics on. Yeah, so so this means your like most prime rates are gonna be around four point uh, seven right now, right? Mm -hmm. So most variables out there are prime minus one to prime minus 0.5. So most variables now are 3.7 to 4.2. Remember when variables were like one? Like literally one, like yeah. 1.18, 1.38. Yeah, so... Like eight weeks ago? As we said before, <laughs> if, like, if you have a fixed product locked in, it, it doesn't much matter. And there's going to be some people out there high five in because they've got a fixed product at three and a half or, or under. Um, Even now, at four I think, and a half, like we talked about two weeks ago on the podcast, <laughs> you'd be like, oh shit, the next rate hike, all the people with variable are going to be higher than me. So the, now the question is like, what's next? Because they don't meet in August. This is part of the reason that I was like, they're definitely doing 75. I did not think they were going to do 100 basis points. Um, but they don't meet in August because... Freaking government shuts down, like doesn't do stuff in August. Not nice the government. Outside. I know they're separate from government. Whatever. Um, so I felt I believe that they were under a lot of pressure uh, when they saw the May numbers come out. They saw what the Fed did in the states. 
they see things not quite. Did flowing. they say the May and June numbers for real estate? <laughs> yeah, they're well. The real estate numbers lag, man. This is and the they problem. also don't the put that. They also don't lag. put those in inflation. They don't. They don't. But like, there's going to be a lot of pressure here coming soon to not do go crazy for any more. Um, so they don't meet again until September. So these are the rates. Breathe deep. Variable wise, these are the rates that we're going to have at least until September. Um, the other thing is. If, if you, you can go back and look for the receipts and listen to the podcast, but also see the comments and, and, the, and things, I was predicting that by the end of the year, the overnight rate would be somewhere between 3 and 3.25. So we're right now at 2.5. So this is one of those things where I'm shocked by the exact thing that I thought was going to happen actually happening um, because I said that I felt that way and never really like could stomach and believe it. But we're now... Like, you know, that that still implies another 75 basis points in September. And I think they meet either September, October, November, or they meet three more times this year. Yeah, so they'll get 75 for sure. That would be the <sighs> bottom end. Because I'm sure it'll be, it'll be 100. It'll be another 100 for sure. A little My. helicopter in the background here. We got a cool studio. Shout out B&V. Yeah. Um, Can I get some underground parking, though? Jeepers took me forever parking. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, that, that's just... My mind is blown. That's the biggest news story out there. But I want to also just dive. We need into your other news. news. Okay. We need your oh, my news. new personal news. We oh, asked man. for personal news, and Chandler is so distracted with the hundred basis <sighs> points. Okay. Um, so, Lord Willen, uh, by the time this comes out, I will have closed on that new twelve unit. Yep. Um, I leave here and I send a big drop a big draft off at um, my lawyer after this. So. Mm-hmm. Lord willing, that closes this week, uh, which will be the Friday before this episode comes out. Um, Congratulations. I have all those 14 units officially vacant. Um, and it's been a form DR5 rent eviction. I'm doing the quotations. That's what they call them. Um, learning experience, to say the least. Yep. Did you have um, to do any hearings? I didn't have to do any hearings. Very fortunate. But it was touch and go with a couple. Um, I think I can kind of speak a little more candidly about it now because it's in the past. Um, everyone, the form DR5 entitles tenants to three months compensation mm-hmm. and three months notice. And I always kind of go above and beyond that. One, just to make life simpler and have more likelihood of getting a smooth process. And two, in a lot of cases, I just genuinely feel that's not enough money because some of these people are on fairly low rents. So three times their really low rent isn't necessarily a, a big compensation. So I always kind of top that up, pay $500 towards mu- moving costs, pay half a month, you know, full security deposit, no question. Yeah. And little things like I get them boxes. I usually have a bin on site that they can throw stuff in. So you try to make it work as best you can. Yep. Um, and, but I had one, they were entitled by the letter of the tenancy rules, which can only be three months. Like that's all the tenancy board can award is three months. They can adjust the time, but all they can award is, is three months. So they were entitled to about 2,400 bucks. Plus I was like, I'll give you your 500. I'll give you your security. It was going to come somewhere in the 3000. And they had someone kind of representing them through this process, yep. and they asked for nine thousand nine thousand six hundred and ninety five dollars, if I basis? remember correctly. Um, they made out a list they of a new how car? many hours it would take to move, and and the support people that they would need around them to help with the move. They put an uh. hourly wage on that, and they said this is what it would cost. Uh, and they said in exchange for this, they would sign a non disclosure. Meaning they wouldn't. I respect that part. They wouldn't talk to the media, and they wouldn't talk to any other tenants in the building. Um, and we found a common ground because this was a unique situation where these tenants did need some assistance moving. Um, but I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this is someone asking for ten thousand dollars to move, and like I'm not in a position to be able to pay for that. Yeah. Uh, but I don't want to go to the hearing, and I want to, you know, work something amicably. So we did work something out, and it was somewhere in between. Um, and then I had another one where we had an agreement, <sighs> and. You know, was signed. That, is that justified though? I, I, not to sound every like case hard. is unique, right? Like these guys needed some assistance in, in their move. Um, so you have to be malleable and, and you have to contextualize like each individual tenant. And, you know, I paid more to another guy who had put work into his unit and been there for a longer period of time. Um, and then I had one most recently where she had agreed to move out on a, the date and it was all signed and everything. And then she just did not move, didn't move an inch. Um, and so that one got a little bit more confrontational, but that one's been resolved here. Um, about Did a you week. have to get the sheriff involved? No, I didn't, fortunately. Um, okay. But, uh, you know, she overstayed by 
a couple weeks, right? Not the um, end of the world, it happens. Not the end of the world, but that's what I've been going through on the existing units um, while preparing to close this other property, which I'm super yeah, excited this about. This probably and super awesome because it's in a great neighborhood, uh, nice purpose-built building. Like it's it's close. It's in it's in your same district, your wheelhouse. Yeah. Like it, it can. It's honestly, I'd say, in, like in a better direction. Like continuing down towards like the downtown areas. Yeah. It also has a garage. It does, right? Like yeah. underground How many parking. Is it four stories? It's only I want to say three stories, but like it has a proper podium, like a garage, underground it's parking. It's on a sloped lot, right? So yeah, it has yeah. the side drive-in. Yeah. No, that's neat. Yeah. How many parking spots underneath? I think there were twelve, but one of them was no converted way. to a storage. So I'm going to convert that back. I'm going to have twelve underground parking spots for twelve units. Like what that type is, unit? What size units? Uh, predominantly one bedrooms. There's a couple one plus dens, and there's a couple bachelors. But okay. Yeah. Okay. So neat. that's my my current project, and I'm already kind of looking like all right. That's 12 new people who are going to be a, a really important part of my life in the next three months that I've got to talk to them about what their plans are and have already reached uh, agreements in principle with, with a number of them through the existing landlord. This is one of the things you can do if you're buying a property is if you have a good relationship and an open dialogue. I'm all about being transparent and having communication. So, um, you know, the, the landlord, the existing owner got that impression from me and was able to convey that to the tenants and say, like, listen, this is who the guy is. This is what his plans are. This is what he's going to be doing. And and so um, the process has already started, even though I haven't closed on it yet. Yeah. Which is kind of nice. They're not going to be happy. It's going to be a whole thing. But, yeah. um, you know, not Is there an wood. elevator in that building? There is not. There's not. Okay. Yeah. This is your first underground parking garage? Yeah. Congratulations. It's, cool. it's super cool. neat when you add little things yeah. like that on. Same with the elevator. I know one of my clients, when uh, he bought his first place with an elevator, he was just like, this is cool. It's my first elevator. Man. Yeah. I'm like, that is, that is super neat to think that you're like... Going to that point. Yeah, so that's my personal news. Obviously, that's taken like every penny I got to my name uh, <laughs> while rates are going through the roof. So <laughs> Things are great. <laughs> um, yeah, I might be airbnb out my own house <laughs> yeah, soon. Uh, <laughs> if anyone wants to lease my car. Um, that Don't joke about that. Know, that you probably get more on than your Airbnb in your house. Yeah. It's, right now, people are beating each other for cars. Actually, I have a car. I should be, what the heck? I should be renting my house. Yeah, you should be renting yours for rap videos. Uh, what's new with uh, with you? You haven't uh, had news lately, so come on, Neil. Give me yeah, something. Yeah, no, I got some news, and I've I kind of been lagging off here. So I kind of forgot about this. It's been in the background, but I have a house that I'm building for myself personally. Yeah. It's not a brand new house. I bought an older home um, on Grand Lake, and it started with the reno being like an internalized reno within the actual house itself, mm-hmm. basically updating everything on a f- like facade level, uh, adding fully finishing the basement and adding an extra bathroom upstairs to make it a master ensuite. As I started to get into it, I realized I wanted a garage and then where the garage would be placed. It was close to the house. So I was like, why don't we put a second story in the garage? Mm. And I was like, oh, that'd be kind of neat. Can we attach it to the house? I'm like, well, then we have this to This one rates were low and this one rates were low and money great. was free. <laughs> and and you could sell a house in two seconds. So income was great. And I was like, well, then if we have to attach the garage to the house and we have to rip the roof off the house, so that doesn't make Oops. sense. Um, My bad. Long story short, I ended up building a two-story garage and attaching to the house via a breezeway, which is super neat because the hallway upstairs just ends at a dead end. There was a closet there, and so I actually punched through that closet and... Sorry, um, but that Neil, my, my BlackBerry ring uh, just interrupted Neil. Let dude, me see. Dude, dude, <laughs> I got to turn this thing off. Yeah. Uh, Who's but, it? To- sorry. So, yeah. As, <laughs> all good. So, as I was saying... Knocking through the breezeway. Yeah. So... So there's an internal reno, was adding a bathroom. Next thing you know, I'm adding in a garage, adding a two-story garage with a master ensuite. Because I was like, you know what? This is a house on the lake. If I'm ever going to resell this or make it into a proper home, it needs a proper master. So then we ended up turning the entire above garage space into a master kind of pad. Uh, and we blew a hole through an old closet and built an actual breezeway. So you go up a set of stairs and it walks you into another floor. So now there's it's like a back split and now there's another level and that's all just for the master. Um... Anyways, it, it's been quite the reno. The budget basically tripled. <laughs> um, and it was a six-figure reno to begin with. Um, and yeah. then as we were getting into it all and things were coming along, my engineer was over looking at the new addition. And he was looking at the old roof. And he was like, ah, that old roof doesn't look great. So we cut it open. And it really isn't great. And so now halfway through all this, we had to cut the roof off. So last, about maybe Jesus, two, three weeks ago. man. Why didn't you just build a new house, bro? I, we should have. And so we ended up cutting the roof off, got a new roof. But the nice thing is now that I have the new roof on, we added about two feet of ceiling height. So I think in my main living room and kitchen, we have maybe like 15, 18 foot ceilings, 
which is really nice. Like it added mm. a whole new oh, yeah, kind of I mean, level. It sounds gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's going to come out really sharp. Um, but we're getting into like that, trying to make a schedule to get this thing finished. And there's so much stuff. The biggest thing I, I kind of overlooked too was like how much custom stuff costs. <laughs> like no I'm kidding. so used to doing vanities in apartment buildings yeah. or like regular house flips that I've done in the past. And I'm like, okay, like yep. apartment buildings, I spend 350 of vanity. Great. House flips, I spend five, 600 of vanity. Great. I just got quoted for three custom vanities, and they're just two singles and one double. But they're better built. They're, they're one better off, built. They're, they're one size. off. They're quartz yeah. tops, all that crap. But it's eighteen thousand dollars, so it's six thousand dollars of vanity. Damn, right? So it's like holy Jeepers. Jesus, like that. That's a grand, lot of money. Just I would have renovated an entire unit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like holy, I think you maybe you need to shop around some, some vanities. Well, like, this is and so like everything, even yeah. like electrical, like electrical for the house is gonna be like fifty thousand bucks, sixty thousand bucks. Just to get the house wired up and, and running. Like, there was so much, because we're doing so much stuff, right? Like, there's. You're basically there's, building new, which is like, hey man, high end lakefront like that. You're. It's building new, but it's also like the finishes. Hundred. Like, we're doing, yeah. we're doing um, under all, like, there's custom cabinetry and all How many square of the house. Feet? I got to remeasure it now. I don't know, maybe 3,000, 3,500. Yeah, I mean, a, a renovation of a 3,000 square foot home, if it's a total renovation, um, high end, you're probably 180 bucks a square foot. Yeah, but you're not a total renovation. You're keeping some stuff, so it's pretty know. close to total. And we're doing an addition, and there's a garage okay. being built. So, and then the backyard. So we have a landscape Jeez, designer working in the backyard. Feet. It's gonna be very neat. Well, maybe we'll do a tour when it's all said and done. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it just kept spiraling. Like there's so many, so many things that get added on. But it'll be. Uh, I'm super excited to get it done. I'm like targeting September to spend at least one week in there. I spend one week this summer in there. I'm calling September summer. And uh, and I'll be happy with my life, but it's and definitely. And are you gonna tough. move there right away? No, I intend like it's a cottage at the end yeah. of the day. Um, so I'd like to use it for another summer after that, and then potentially look at flipping it over. Yeah. Uh, once maybe the rates have cooled off a little bit, oh. and the market sentiments change. <laughs> really, uh, yeah. Neil's really banking on the uh, waterfront luxury homes during a recession. Yeah, exactly. I'm hoping. I'm hoping that world stays alive. But follow us for more savvy investment advice. So that that's going on. Um, I, I think I've already mentioned it, but I just finished a six unit property that we turned over. Yeah. Um, so we got it emptied out. We got it all the units. Um, all new everything like we do with every bu- building we're releasing it now we're actually beating the lease rates we expected which is great unfortunately again what we've talked about we talked about on our patreon just because the appraisal is amazing doesn't mean anything it's about yeah. how much you can service how much debt you can service and these yeah. rate hikes are going up faster than these rental hikes are going up uh, yeah. and because of that we are actually probably gonna pull out less money than we originally anticipated uh, so that part kind of sucks the appraisal came back way higher, way, way higher. Like our original appraisal from when we first bought on that street to today is probably up about 45%. Actual pullout money is probably only up about 5% and cost to do the rent is up about 30%. And this is where you can really get pinched. Cheapers. Um, the only good news for me, I guess in my head, is I have the same similar cash flow. Um, and in the future, there'll be a lot of equity there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's how I'm looking at it. But it's just something to, yeah. to consider. Like, it was crazy when the bank came through and he's like, yeah, like, your approval still stands, but we got to recheck your debt service ratio. Um, again, we talk about this on the Patreon. So if you guys want to know more and understand exactly what I'm saying there, please check out our Patreon. It's launching on Monday of next week. Um, and and they're like, yeah, based on that, we can actually only give you this much, which is so contrary. I think I mentioned it before on the podcast, but last year when I did a CMHC refi, I asked for a certain amount of money and they actually offered me more. But that's because rates were so low, yeah. and I was beating the rents. And now the rates are going up, and I'm beating the rents by way more. But they're actually offering me less. So hmm. all good though. Again, it, it, this is why I was obsessed with buying really, really good deals because it actually works out that I'll still be able to cover off all of my stuff. The burr model on this building will still work, and the couple that I have remaining yeah. on the street. Yeah. Um, and like we said, you know, it'll change your equity in the property. It just means you won't be able to pull as much cash out. But. Yeah, I'm going to take a 24-month term so that I'm ready for a refi on CMHG. Just because people will be curious, that's road. a six-unit in Spryfield, right? Yeah. And those are completely renovated two-bedroom units? Yep. Are you able to share what you're getting for rents? Uh, yeah, around 1550 plus heat and power. 1550 tenant pays their own heat and power. Yeah. I think top floor, maybe 1600 basements, maybe 1500 Yeah. Um, they're about 800 square feet. Uh, comes with a parking space, and we've done everything. Like it's all new, everything. Like yeah, there'll be people that are like fifteen fifty to live in Spryfield, but like man, this is like a totally renovated. You know, these are nice units. Like, yeah, these are nice units. And you'll see in a lot of places. Yeah. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. All stainless steel appliances. You have a dishwasher, quartz countertops. 
Um, I'm asking because I want to know how much I can charge for mine when I've got them yeah. all geared up. <laughs> ceramics in the bathrooms, like ceramic floors, ceramic uh, surrounds on the tubs, nice yeah. vanities. Like they're they're done up pretty nicely, um, and they're designed to last. Hopefully, yeah. so we'll see how how they depreciate as time goes on. Yeah, yeah, cool. But well, that's exciting, man. Um, yeah, I know you were working on those refis for a while, so you got some more coming, I think, too. Yeah, exactly. I, I think I'm hoping to clean up a bunch of stuff here and make some moves coming up again, and get back into the game in the next three months. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got some uh, other news. We're just going to bounce around here before we get into our main topic, which is Airbnb. So I know yep. a lot of you have asked us about that. We've now actually have some experience in it personally. So we're going to talk a bit about that. If you listen to this point, don't forget to like follow, subscribe. The likes have made a big difference on our traffic. I know it doesn't mean much to you, but it takes two seconds. So just like you hit that button yep. and, and it's, it's good things for us. Yep. Um, so we were getting all these conflicting things because there've been some massive sales. There's the biggest uh, sale in New York City to date just happened uh, on a unit. It's nearly 7,000 square feet. It's 6,700 square feet. Um, and it's got its own pool, like a dedicated pool. Imagine buying a condo that you have your own pool. Guess how much you think it went for? Biggest sale of the year. It's got to be a big number. For Manhattan? Yeah. 7,600 square feet? 6,700 square feet. 6,700? Plus like another something crazy, like 2,000 square feet of, of amenity outdoor just to, to, to the Privately street. to that unit? Yeah. 135 million? No, no, you're way too high. Way too high? Yeah, 74 mil. Oh, well, I would have bought that. That's a bargain. Change. When I say I would have bought that if I sold my entire life and Chandler's life and we combined everything to make the down payment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so and the median sale now is up to 1.25 million, which is actually less, less than I would have thought. Um, that's what's in New York. Okay, I couldn't remember if New York was a thousand dollars a square foot or two thousand dollars a square foot, and for some reason I thought it was two thousand. Well, it's, it would be two thousand square foot for sure at the smaller stuff. Yeah, but like once a, you once you tip over a certain price point, um, yeah, like that looks like a bargain at about twelve uh, twelve hundred a square foot. Yeah, they're yeah. giving them away. They're giving them away. But another one, this was crazy. So uh, a developer and like a, a housing investment firm purchased six buildings across New York with thousands of units in them. Because like one of the buildings has in its own has like 450 units in a 50-story building. Yeah. They bought the whole portfolio for $1.75 billion. Casual purchase. Man. And uh, they've got thousands. How many units was it? It's, I don't know. There, there's like thousands. They didn't have the total of the units because okay. they don't know the, the exact of addresses. But um, 1,700 of them were rent-controlled. But still, rents in these units range from thirty nine hundred to seven thousand bucks. That seems like a really good deal. Uh, see, I mean, one, <laughs> we, we're, we're going to get the specifics on that deal and break it down. I want to see what that looks like. Yeah, um, but I mean, like that's a lot of people throwing some big money around. But the impression I got from it a bit was someone smaller scale selling out to a bigger developer and a big housing, you know, residential real estate investment company. So this could be. Uh, you, you know, a, a smaller thing being devoured to some degree. And that's a big, pretty big bite. Um, Can I give my hypothesis on why I think that guy bought the $75 million condo? Why? So those money, are, money laundering? <laughs> well, money laundering, my usual hypothesis. But in general, a lot of people made a ton of money in the last couple of years. Uh, inflation's going crazy. And real estate's a strong bet in inflationary times. And these guys are buying these cash. So these rate yeah. hikes really mean nothing to them. And the next person that's going to buy it is going to buy it cash from them as well. Right. So for these guys, this is cash storage on these places Crazy. and yeah. inflation kind of protects their investment in that asset. Yeah. So. It's an interesting thing because it's such a, we talk about this now, like why would someone buy right now? Why would someone buy right now? It's like, well, if you're trying to beat inflation, like, in, or in, in weird case, like beat um, like a recession, real estate actually does pretty well because it's for savings. It can generate income. The long-term trend is up. It's not money sitting in a bank account that's just depreciating every day. Yeah, and you'll um, feel that 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 win down the road. You're not going to feel it today, right? It's going to hold today. It's going to hold stable. It's going to be pretty solid during this period. But then when rates start to pop back down, it'll go up more than what you have potentially would have lost during this time. Yeah. Uh, let's bounce over to China. I saw this cool article, and this speaks to some of the stuff we talked about before, that some real estate developers are starting to accept wheat, garlic, and peaches as down payments. I saw that. I saw that, which is, that's an indicator, because I find, like, their population is very... <laughs> an indicator of what? Well, <laughs> that, that food, food's about to yeah. go crazy. Food scarcity yeah. is coming on, on, the, on the plate. Like, that's, everyone's kind of mumbling about it, but no one said anything, because, again, we can still go to Superstore and buy whatever we want. We can still go to Sobeys and buy whatever we want. But food scarcity is on the, on the plate, and a lot of people that are it in the know is. and people that are 
higher up, I find you're hearing them talk about how food scarcity is going to be a big issue. And so to see, I find the um, Asian populations tend to be a lot more forward thinking. Like when they hear that stuff in those countries or they'll, they'll face it more, they'll experience it earlier on mm -hmm. and they tend to make rapid changes. Like I feel like the North American culture is again, we kind of rely on our government and we expect that yeah, the corporations like we are pay come money through. for this and that's exactly the way things are transacted and blah, blah. Yeah. But in Asian countries where their governments are a little bit less um, involved, we'll say not less involved, but they, they maybe aren't as in able to offer things to their citizens as they are in, in the countries that we live in. People take it upon themselves to protect themselves. And so you're seeing that there. They're already starting to do that. Yeah. Something that's kind of neat, and I don't have the news headline, but I think Bill Gates now is the second largest landholder in the U.S. next to the government itself. And he's buying up farmland like crazy. Mm. And he's leasing it back to the farmers. And I've been trying to figure out why is he doing that. Obviously, holding land's great. But is it because with <laughs> these food shortages and the spikes... Is he expecting to be able to crank these lease rates up on the farmers? I don't think so. I think he's gonna he's looking long term at government heavy um, involvement back in food production back or, or for the first time. So he's gonna really lease know. to the government, uh, or just know that there's gonna be massive incentives to own that property and turn out food. Um, I'm telling you guys, like, look up. I, I wanted to talk about this this episode, but there's just too much research that I need to to go into it. I, I didn't have time. But look We're gonna up do it in the next one. Look up these uh, farmer strikes, like. The, someone referenced it and said and compared it to the convoy thing here. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess like some farmers dumped a, a couple truckloads of manure outside of like their local government office. Um, but everything's been peaceful and good. But this is real serious stuff. Like if, if, if we get further, if we get more issues that are going to cause further food shortages... It's problematic. And I was talking to we're someone on Instagram issues. today because we were talking, uh, like I was making some sort of comment about, you know, the printing money. And she rightly noted that the money supply thing isn't the biggest problem in inflation right now. And we've said this from the jump. Like, this isn't a demand problem. All these rate hikes are trying to address demand. The big problem is on the supply side of things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people kind of don't really notice what's going on in the rates. You know, if they're not actively out there buying real estate, they're not paying that much attention, blah, 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 blah. They might be on a fixed product. The, a lot of this that we're freaking out about here, people don't care about. People care about the cost of their food and the cost of their gas. Yep. And those are two things that are skyrocketing. There's no sign. I know gas pulled down a little bit, but long term, if you look at gas... That's a fu temporary fix. Yeah, if you look at gas futures, man... the gas oil is going down. 100%. Like, gas is going to stay high. The food stuff is what's going to really get the people in the streets angry and check out the farming, the farmer situation over we, in we've Europe. We've talked about this before with oil and gas. So it's coming here. I'm telling you, this is going to be the next thing in, in Western Alberta or, or, or Western Canada. In the next couple of years, you're going to see this sort of pushback from farmers. Yeah, and this is what we talked about with oil and gas. They, to fix that, they need to crank up the production. Reducing the taxes aren't going to change it, and it's going to be the same thing with food. They, they have to crank up the production. So they're going to have to put out incentives to produce. And I'll let, that'll, again, I'll provide us with more jobs and it'll provide and us with more food. Some of these food green things give are us some more security. disincentivizing the production. They need to be partially parked for a minute because yeah. it's amazing to be green, but if everyone's going broke and or starving to death, it doesn't really matter about being green 100%. Anymore, and we're right? guilty of that here hyper-locally. Like everyone here is complaining about the cost of stuff. And what do we do? We pass extra taxes to pay for, you know, basically green idea it's like now is not the time man yeah it's not the time the property tax they they crank, crank it up on a climate change based tax and i said yeah it's always the time and it, yeah we just don't not. have the money right now we exactly. don't have the money right now um anyway so that was kind of a, a couple interesting things going on with the, with the food issue what do you got i was just going to talk about this and this is another thing kind of on the inflation topic but it's not counted in inflation is toronto rental rates so in Toronto, rental rates for May were up 16.5% year over year yep. from 1998 a month for a two bedroom on average to 2327. And mm -hmm. then for June, they were up 20% year over year to 2463 on average. Cheapers. Now, this is kind of contrary because last year they had actually been, or sorry, in 2020, yeah, 2021 last year, they were down 9.2% from 2020. And 2020, they were down 7% from 2019. So for two years, we've had declining. But hmm. then they made up all of the losses yeah. and, and have continued up. Am I, are we ready for conspiracy theory right now? Let's hear it. I don't know exactly where this data is being collected from. Um, I believe this data is being collected from the banks because I feel like they can pull up the stuff and provide it because where else would they be getting yeah. it from? Okay. They're not getting it from the tenants. Landlords don't really submit. But even if the landlords do submit. But here's kind of an hypothesis. There's also like a, some really 
uh, rudimentary data mining that goes on from some of these online um, rental agencies where like a third party goes in and says, well, based on what we saw in Kijiji, this is the average. And those are really imperfect. So hopefully it's not that. Yeah, I don't think it's that. I honestly believe that it's numbers that are getting popped out from banks and CMHC that they're getting yep. from applications. Okay. And my honest to God belief in Toronto is like the hub of this is the reason that these numbers are able to spike and change up and down so rapidly is this is all based on approvals. Because I talked to somebody there and said, I don't know that we're feeling it as much actually on the ground. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And they said, because people create leases Mm. and they submit them. And so now to get an approval that you needed two months ago, you only needed two grand to get approved to get your mortgage done. Right. Somebody's putting together a lease now, 2,500 bucks, and they're submitting that. Right. And it's happening so fast. Toronto is right. notorious for people faking all their documentation to get mortgages. Yep. I think this is another piece that changes. And so they've been mm. able to let them slide. They've been providing real leases. And that's why the rates are going to, as rates are going down, the rents are going down because they were actually just like, well, well I'm not going to fake a lease if I don't have to. Like, I'm not going to put myself in that right, risk. Right. And so I'll give you my actual lease, which is 1800 bucks. And you guys will give me my full 75%. Right now rates spike. And they said, you need to be making 2200 bucks a month. Well, in classic TO fashion, they put More together a fraud. lease, yeah, and they sent yeah. it in, and they're they're basing it off of that, and I think that's Ooh, what's actually gosh. causing it to swing in such an, an expansive way. Like yeah. I know I don't yeah. I don't discredit that rental demand is insane. Like it, by no means is it, it it's but crazy, it might actually be inflated. But I think that this yeah. is being inflated, and I think the fact that it's changing that fast because the amount of unit turnover that would need to take place to move that bubble with that many units in a, in a market. Yeah, it would have to be a lot of new units coming on market. It would have to be yeah. an absurd amount of new units to move it up 20%. like In rent control where you can't get that In a rent yeah. controlled place. like yeah. It doesn't make any sense to me. But anyways, mm. I thought that was kind of neat. Regardless, totally rents are up. My rents are up and they're continuing to go up and the demand is going up because a lot of people are losing their ability to get approved for homes and or even if they have the ability, they're like, you know what? I'm going to sideline for a year and come revisit this because I believe prices are going to be down. And so they're renting. So rental is going nuts. Um, but again, I just don't know that it's that, that much. Mm. Um, Hey guys, thanks for listening up until this point coming up. We have a pop quiz Chandler grills me and I actually kill it coming. uh, We have some conspiracy theories. And as you know, I love my conspiracy theories. And then our topic of the day, which is Airbnb Chandler and I differ on this, but it's a lot of great information. Keep listening. Thanks guys. Total switch here. Your boy, Elon is in the news. He's my boy. A um, couple things about Elon. One, for the first time, they weren't the biggest producers of electric vehicles this year today. Did everyone's that? been talking about this in the background. What, what what was it? I've been hearing like everyone so thinks Tesla's company, the big one, but there's others. There's a company called BYD that um, just surpassed them this year to date. Chinese company? Yeah, but also with some American ties. Who do they make like for Hyundai or something? Um, no, they're their own thing. Yeah, but like do they produce like... The tra- chassis for an American company. Oh, I'm not or sure, man. I'm not sure. Um, but they produced in the first six months of this year 641,000 plus electric vehicles, whereas Tesla only produced 564,000. Tesla had a lot of supply issues, a lot of chip issues. One thing I will say is that BYD does partially like full electric vehicles and but also hybrids. So oh. some of those skew that number. Tesla still did the most pure electric. Um, Tesla taking the W. Yeah, but but in a in a significantly closing gap, obviously, which speaks to the fact of like a lot of people think the Tesla stock is massively overrated. And while we're staying with your boy, he's trying to back out of the Twitter deal. Um, so when he purchased Twitter, he he offered effectively I think fifty four bucks a share. Yeah, it's now trading at thirty six dollars a share, uh, and he's trying to back out of this deal, which probably forfeits a pretty big deposit. But they're talking, they being uh, Tesla's board are going to sue him probably for what's called specific performance or some variation of, which is that, no, we're going to sue you to execute on the deal as agreed. Um, That is going to be messy. And And this is, this is the problem with Twitter itself. Is he, did he make a post on Twitter that he's trying to buy Twitter? Oh, at the time. Yeah. Yeah. See if he hadn't done that and kept it all under wraps. There's no way that was going to stay under wraps, man. He was like actively at that, at that stage, at that stage though, he could have kept it under wraps. And, and then when you go to the lawsuit, the amount of like, brand image damage and specific damage that they can go after would be shrunk dramatically. Right. I don't know if these guys really care. Um, but yeah, I it, mean, I'm sure he's got a due diligence clause in there and he backed out it'll because be, it'll be a multi-year battle of, of the ages. Um, yeah. That was a weird one for him to take on. And I don't know if this, you know, cause I, you wonder all what, you never know what that guy's plan is. I, I, to both of these points though, I love how like the news in general, is just looking for him to make a mistake 
or to slip or to not not execute on something and then everyone's like ah look like he's getting beat by another company making electric cars or like he doesn't actually produce or all these things and it's like you still got to give the guy credit for taking things to the level that he has and like yeah, nothing yeah, totally. is perfect and i think people like underestimate what it takes to get like a company like spacex that launches and reuses rockets going like who was doing private space stuff like that prior to him going that hard with it and making it even on some level of affordability? I know it was fifteen million dollars a ticket to go the first time, but like that's also you're buying you're buying a piece of history by doing that. That was a little different. Yeah. But he's done so many things, and it's same with these electric cars. Like everyone's like, oh, the Cybertruck, this Cybertruck, that. Guys, it's the business. He hyped it up, took a bunch of deposits, utilized that as for funding to take funding, and then actually basically make the Cybertruck come to life. So he, that's the only way you can do these ideas in today's world because everything's so uh, heavy technology advanced. Like, unfortunately, you can't grassroots a mass-produced automobile. You just can't. Like, how is someone going to, out of their garage, just piece together, like, yeah, I took these parts off my lawn chair mm-hmm. and I had $4,000, so I scraped it together and now we have a vehicle that's reliable, like everyone's expectations, does everything that every car does now, which is, like, they have more power yeah. than the average computer and I was able to do it out of my garage. Like, it's just not, it's not possible. So you need to fundraise all this capital you need to create this hype so he's a master in his domain of yeah. creating a ton of hype creating a ton of value and he has executed on a lot of things like when you think 10 years ago to what tesla was and what they are today and then he also goes after lots of cool ideas like the tesla roof the battery packs uh they were doing something else i saw the other day that's amazing he's touching on hydrogen like anything he can get involved in that like i think these are revolutionary Starlink. things Starlink, yeah. like that's a crazy one. That's gonna be Wi-Fi around the entire world. It's already starting to work good, uh, really well for airplanes. People are starting to get in their houses. Like, yeah, these are revolutionary things. Like, no one's brought oh, yeah. I mean, Wi-Fi I'm not to, to the third world. I'm not, I'm yeah, not yeah. saying you are. I'm yeah. not saying you are. I'm saying the news is just so quick to pump something like that. No one, like, you don't frequently Neil's be like, fan. I am a fan, man. Like, you know what? You know what that takes? Like, that yeah, is yeah. a yeah, serious totally. skill to do that. Yeah. In, in his lifetime, like it's not like he even like had a previous gen that he was taken over for. Yeah. Like PayPal, yeah. that like automated payments, like he's done so many crazy things. I'm like, I yeah. don't understand why more people don't love him. And like, you're, if you're going to cry over a few things he says on Twitter, like just understand like, yeah, you gotta be a little bit quirky and a little unique to actually make these things happen. Yeah. And not everyone's got the same beliefs as you. And like, it's great to be like holier than thou, but I'd still take Elon and all of his weird tweets over like not having all the advancements in, in technology and in this world that he's made. Totally. I think like self-driving, too. nobody was giving a crap about self-driving and then Elon went ballistic with it. And now everyone's like, Oh yeah, we all got self-driving. Yeah. Like, Oh, that is going to be the future. Everyone's yeah, got yeah. electric cars yeah. now. Um, now it's another good time to just take a quick pause and say, if you, uh, if you also like Elon Musk, you can press a little like button. I, I know it's not just Neil. So press the like <laughs> button, press the subscribe, uh, for, for our boy Elon. Yeah. Um, all right, so we're going to turn to our, our main topic here, which is the Airbnb uh, stuff, because we now have a little bit of experience, but I would love to do a little pop quiz for you. Oh, God, another pop this. quiz. I got some stuff on Metaverse and stuff, but we'll save it for another pod. It's all yeah, good. Yeah, we got, we got so much stuff. All right, so a survey was done in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Uh, asking people how much money, net worth, do you think it takes for someone to be considered wealthy? And this ranged, mm-hmm. as you would expect, city to city. Yeah, but across the board in the U.S., what did the average person? This is like a family feud, man. I need a definition of wealthy, though. I need a definition of wealthy. Um, Asset wealth, net worth. So, like, we're talking top one percent, top ten percent. Oh gosh, to just oh my god, man, you're really. I want details. uh, This isn't rich. This is this is wealthy. This isn't the super rich. This is like what someone. So wealthy is above rich. Oh my god! Like, what are your pegs? Rich? It's like it's like cars. It's cars, sports cars, supercars, hypercars. You're ruining the whole quiz, this guy. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. How it much is, money you need to have in the bank? Or how much income you need to make? No, this is this is total net worth, basically. Like, what what kind of like if someone is worth this amount, we consider them wealthy across the board in the states. Yeah. Two point two million. Did you cheat? You did freaking cheat. This man. is why he, I had questions. He this looked is, at this email. This, man, that's bullshit. This, you looked at my sheet. <laughs> this is why. I, no, I didn't. I no, swear to God. Man. I swear to God. Okay, I, it was two point two million. Let's go. I did. That's why I had all these questions. I needed to cheater. get my research and stuff in. Cheater. I just quickly right. extrapolated everyone's income over twenty. No, I'm kidding. So the most guess. expensive is San Francisco. What does it take to be considered wealthy? If you ask a bunch of San Francisco, I San Franciscoans. Now I'm Simpson? stressing. I'm trying to look at your sheet. Um, what's it? What's what constitutes being San wealthy in Fran? San Francisco? Most expensive wealthy? part. Three point seven million. Uh, 
way higher, 5.1 to be considered wealthy Holy in San Francisco. Jesus. Yeah, so if you ask people from San Francisco what's wealthy, they'd be like, oh, I don't know, you're worth about 5.1 mil? USDs. Uh, in Southern California, next most expensive. What's it to be wealthy there? Uh, it's no San Fran. We're Southern Cal. 4.2. Close, 3.9. Okay. And then what does it take to be considered wealthy in beautiful New York City? If you asked a bunch of New Yorkers, ask them how much uh, it takes I'd say to be three and a half mil. 3.4. Neil knows what it takes. I've been watching be those charts. Neil's got his goals got <laughs> yeah. written on the wall. Uh, Knocked to the park. Good job. All right, let's dive into Thank some you. Airbnb now. Yeah. All right, let's talk about our main topic. Um, Airbnb, the reason this is coming up is partially because I posted a story about it um, and I threw a bunch of money symbols up and people are excited. <laughs> and yeah. also because something we've mentioned a few times, Chandler recently got into it with a purchase of his, and I think he's going to be getting into it more with some more purchases and some of his current properties, or potentially not. It sounded like our parking lot chat that he said, I ain't into the b and um, But I'll, I'll explain my kind of how it came to be, my experience with it so far, and then we'll let Chandler rip it to shreds. So I have a 12-unit property, which we renovated, um, and it is eight two-story, two-bedroom units, which are a little bit bigger. They rent really well. They all have parking. And then it also has four single-story, two-bedroom apartments that are a little smaller. They're like, I'd say maybe 600 square feet, so they're pretty snug. It's like one decent-sized bedroom, and really it's more of a den than a bedroom um, as a second as a second, bag- second bedroom. sorry. And so we've been renting those around $14, $14.50 plus heat and power. Nice. Um, again, That's fully, good. That's good. Yeah, fully renovated. They're in a good neighborhood. It's old Bedford, so for if people who aren't from Halifax... Um, I'd say like it's a middle class neighborhood, new Bedford. It's like an upper middle class, old Bedford. I'd say it's more of a middle class area. Average price point for a house around there is between five to 700 range. Um, and we're kind of snugged in the middle of like suburbia. Like it's, it's a little like pocket of apartment buildings surrounded by suburbia. Um, anyways, so it's a great location though. Cause you're close to Halifax, right? Like someone could totally stay there and dip to Halifax. No problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so these two bedrooms, though, again, because they are tight, we've, I find we've been getting a lot of turnover with them. Like we've been getting one year lease, one year lease, one year lease. And instead of doing that, this time they turned over, we thought, hey, why don't we try Airbnb? So we decided to do a little bit of research. We're not just going to jump into it because we feel like it. So we went Airbnb, Bedford, two bedroom to see what there was. Yeah. Every single one was booked until October. Yeah, I remember there you saying this. There wasn't a single yeah. one yeah. available. And I was looking through the rates and I was like, you know what? We didn't do this. So then Airbnb is really neat. They offer a little thing where you can analyze your unit. So we went in there and we put yeah. in all the specifics to our unit and it spit out a number of what they expected our revenue to what? be. Six grand. Six grand per month. Six grand per month per unit. Per unit. So that's roughly just Ma- over $200 a night. I think maybe a little less. It's like 5700 Yeah. But roughly 200 bucks a night. Um, and they gave us... Then Airbnb's got a really nice like guide. Like Honestly, <laughs> one of the best resources for getting into Airbnb is Airbnb. Again, that's a really, they're really smart about doing that. It's not like you have to be all over the internet. They give you all the tips and the guides and the videos and everything that they're like, this is a suggestion. Here's a suggestion. Do this, do this. Mm-hmm. This is what helps. Here's what other people have done in your neighborhood. Um, anyways, so then we said, okay, we're going to do it. Um, and so shout out to my girlfriend. She uh, offered to manage them. Uh, we have a management contract with her and I. And so she went out and she sourced all the furniture and put it all together. We ended up spending around forty five hundred to five grand a unit to furnish them. Um, she did made a really good effort of buying stuff off Kijiji. A few of my clients seemed to sell some stuff, so she was able to get deals with them. And then we filled a lot of the rest in with like IKEA. Um, she did a gorgeous job. They did. They came out really, really well. Uh, we brought in a photographer, and so the the agreement we have right now is that I'm as the owner, I'm paying for the furniture and the utilities, and then she takes a percentage fee from the bookings. Um, she then posted it maybe, I feel like it would have been a week and a half ago now, maybe two weeks. And within two weeks, we had two units. Uh, we got them all booked up and for July, August, and we're starting to book into September. So we already have $20,000 in bookings over the next, uh, 10 weeks. So it's working out to about a thousand bucks a week per unit, but there's some, some, some openings left. And right. what we're finding is like, we've been kind of nervous, like, oh, like there's an opening, like we had a unit just the other day. Um, and there was like, this week was kind of dead on the two units. And then sure enough, we got last minute bookings, last minute bookings. Like, it's amazing that we're getting these, these overnight bookings, like the same day, like for like two hours away. And it just keeps happening. And like, people will pay amazing rates to come through. Um, but I want to go back for a second. Something I kind of overlooked. 
that process of setting up, and I kind of jumped over because I wasn't extremely involved. She handled a good majority of it. That was probably one of the hardest parts. Oh, yeah, um, totally. This, the startup oh, yeah. is such a big thing. Like, having to go there, figure out what you need, then order it all and actually get what's in stock that actually fits your space, get there, and then getting the IKEA fr- furniture assembled is a pain <laughs> in, the, in the butt in itself. We did it. Um, it was a real pain. It was a mixture of her doing a bunch. We did some together. Uh, some of my crew went out and did it. No one enjoyed it. So there are companies that do literally just furniture assembly that we're going to utilize for the next one. Um, and it took a few trips. Like you keep forgetting little things. Like there's no matter how good of a list you get, you're literally furnishing this like it's your house. So we had to go. Um, we also in the same time had a lockdown and cleaner because there's a lot of Airbnb cleaning yeah. companies, but they want 150 bucks for a turnover. And unfortunately, like on a small two bedroom like that in a non downtown area or a super non like high end home rental, 150 buck cleaning fee is not worth it when someone's only paying 189 for a night, right? And so, through um, actually thanks to through you guys through Instagram, we posted some stories and I got a ton of replies. And then also, um, I went on Kijiji and we we actually lined up two cleaners. They both offer great rates that fit within our 79 dollar cleaning fee. Um, so we have them now lined up. They came out. We did a, a test run on the unit to make sure everything was good. And so they did really well. And, and so they're going to be moving. We're going to be moving forward with them. Um, and so now it's starting to iron out. But again, there's still so many little things. Like our first probably three or four bookings have taken place. And overall, it's been good reviews. But there's so many little things. Like we missed um, blinds in the, in the second bedroom for one place. Yeah. Uh, one of the beds broke. Like the frame wasn't fully screwed together. So a beam broke in the bed. And then... Um, we a had beam broken the bed, eh? Well, Ooh, this is I was, these units, I was gonna say who? who I don't know. It was a, it was. I'm surprised. It was a steel frame, and they, <laughs> they broke that thing. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was also it was also bunk beds. Um, and so we actually that, on a side note, we set up. I think that actually benefited us as we set up a um, one of the units with bunk beds and listed it as a family unit. And we've been doing really good with that because um, I don't think a lot of places offer that. And so like we literally have a um, a mom and two kids staying in the unit right now. And I think like she's probably been struggling because she's been having to rent three bedroom units for an absurd number. And so now she's able to get a two bedroom with bunk beds. And so it works out right. really well. And again, that might not work on a grand scale, but where we're one unit yeah, in yeah. all of Bedford that probably has bunk beds, it actually works out that there's enough demand to kind of keep us full. Yeah. yeah, you don't have to be the perfect thing for everyone. You just need to be the perfect thing for a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So anyways, overall, we have, I think, around 80% occupancy for July, August, and then part, maybe the first half of September. But again, those last minute bookings are filling up. Um, we put a two night minimum because I think one night minimums, there's some concern about parties um, and potentially who's just crash pads uh, for not so favorable things. Mm-hmm. And so I think most of you guys can figure out what that would be. And so we're trying to avoid that. I've heard a lot of people that I know that are in the Airbnb scene saying to do three night minimums to really avoid the like one nighters that are just coming to crash there for a second and make a mess of your unit. Right. Um, so we might we might actually end up turning up to the the three the three night minimum. The other thing we need to start doing is I think like we've been kind of willy nilly in the sense of approving all the bookings, but there's some overlaps now where there's like one empty day where we really should be trying to make an effort to maybe say oh no like we're not going to take this booking or we put them in a different unit right. to really compact and fill in that whole calendar right because right? it gets important like you you miss one day one day one day that's five days times 200 bucks a night that's a thousand bucks yeah and so but you gotta weigh that against the but if i don't if i force these people to take an extra day or whatever i may lose them you may lose them or you may never ever get the the booking refilled and so that's that's going on my biggest thing right now is just concern about the winter everyone that's in airbnb is like ah prepare yourself man like you're not in a prime location the winter is going to beat you up um, yeah, man, this is, so let me get into my numbers. Yeah. I was gonna say my last, my last mitigation technique for that is we're close to the IBM campus. And so we've been getting IBM rentals. I just saw some messages go by and it's an HR person booking on behalf of their technicians. So mm-hmm. I think it's NSP. Yeah. You need to build that relationship. So sure. we're trying to build some relationships with IBM, NSP, and then another, uh, one of my clients does it for insurance companies. And so I, I work in the restoration space. I know a lot of insurance adjusters. So that's my next reach out is to try and get them involved to help get those consistent bookings. Because mm-hmm. during the winter, insurance goes crazy, right? Claims yeah. are crazy. People's houses are ice damming. Yeah. They need places. Gotcha. But, now, that, that's interesting to know. So mine is different in a lot of respects because I'm in uh, more of a tourist uh, yeah. location. That said, the units are not really right in the downtown core of this tourist area. Um, they're more economic, you know, short visit you're there for, for a purpose for the most point. Yep. Um, and 
I actually just got all of the um, June reporting because I have someone who manages the property for us yep. and is doing a great job. And for the month of June, we had approximately 80 individual reservations. So there's three, That's over un- three units. Yeah, three units plus the yurt, but the yurt's not doing much traffic. It does more stuff in the winter. So effectively, 80, uh, 80 of the 90 nights is yep. a way to look at that. So, you know, just over, I don't know, whatever percentage that would be. Yep. Which is pretty good. That's about as good as you can expect. Yep. They're more economical u- units. So they're only on average about a hundred bucks a night plus cleaning fee. Yep. So the total amount brought in was $8,526. Literally, yeah, okay. hundred bucks, 105 bucks on average. Right. And then the overall, the total, that included cleaning though. And the total cleaning uh-huh. uh, ended up being about f- almost 1500 right? Yep. So that brought it down to 7000 and then the management fee, which is based off the grosses, 20%. So that's like another 1700 bucks. Yep. So long story short, the net was just under $5,300. Still pretty good. Not bad. Right? Yep. But net 5300 bucks. Then you have to think I'm paying for the power there mm-hmm. times three units. It's not that bad this time of year, but it's something. Paying for the water. Mm-hmm. Paying to heat the water. Mm-hmm. Uh, paying for cable internet. Yep. I think it's not unreasonable to say... That's, you know, 450 bucks a month, would you say, Neil? Yeah, I don't know if cold watering accounts because you'd be paying that if it was a ten or an fair, Airbnb. Fair, but like... But for the yeah. sake, we'll say it. Yeah, yeah so, so say it, it's it's more like, you know, 4,900 bucks. Yep. And then I've had to buy, you know, a thousand bucks worth of linens that hopefully I don't have to buy more and more times. But, yep. you know, then there was a little bit of miscellaneous, um, you know, repair and stuff here. that are involved, yeah. You know, so there's probably bucks. been another little bit Let's call it just for easy numbers, forty eight hundred bucks. Yep. This is at the prime. That's June, man. In Lunenburg. That's June in Lunenburg. Like that is the prime. That number will be replicated in July. Yep. Off season, those units have historically been rented as furnished apartments, with rents I think anywhere between like eight hundred and a thousand bucks. Yep. So I think it's not unreasonable to say that you know I could probably rent those furnished and and things like that. Um, for 3000 bucks, yep. really. And if I do that, I could even conceivably shift some of these utilities on to the tenants. Be like, listen, it, this is a normal lease. You're paying for your own internet, blah, 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 blah. Yep. Man, I start to look at that 1800 bucks a month of extra money that I'm making right now yep. and realizing, like you said, in winter, it's going to be nowhere near that. It's going to be lower. It's so be if I make that extra 1800 bucks for, call it... Five months. Not even. That's four generous. months. Four months. What's four times 18, Neil? That's a good question. That's 7,200 bucks. 7,200 bucks. So it's basically 7,200 bucks extra that I make in the prime months. The question is going to be how much do I make less in the in the winter like, months? You know, I, and I, I kind of just like, man, that extra 7,200 bucks over the course of 12 months. So really it's like I'm making an extra 600 bucks a month potentially, yeah. right? Like, damn, man, like, I don't know. I don't know. I think as a large scale investor, it's not worth your time. I think for people who can self-manage, potentially do the cleaning themselves, it can be something that can really add to their baseline income because, and again, this is where like for you, you know what you would do to get your winter bookings through the roof? You throw a hot tub there. And I know, this, but this am the I other investing thing in is a hot tub now? Like you're also doing a discount. My bucks. You're doing a discount model with those units. Right, I think the higher end. This other thing with Airbnb, I think the high end of Airbnb, it makes like infinitely more. Like it goes up exponentially depending on how nice the unit is. And so I think the further you are on that scale, the better you can do. Yeah, but I think if I'm doing luxury apartments down there in this market, I'm also could raise that up quite a bit. Totally. Right? Like so, totally. I, I don't think that's necessarily a, a fair thing. I just, I'm just, I always like, man, is is the juice worth the squeeze? Totally. And man, I'm feeling it a little bit. Like, God, is this? Is this actually worth it? Yeah. Like where the rental market is right now, could I just go on and be like, you know, just sort of curiosity, let's see if someone rent these for 11, 1200 bucks pop. Now I'm up to 3600 bucks as opposed to 4800 bucks. I think where you manage a lot of the units yourself and you're really involved and you have a ton of units and a ton of buildings and now you're spread in multiple cities, this is not worth your squeeze. But this is hands off. This is, I'm not, not even doing anything. I'm just kind of wondering like, well, I, I'm hands off, but you're never totally hands you're off. You're never totally that, hands off. Right? Yeah. This is, and so... Like, again, for what your situation, I don't think it makes sense. But if you're an investor out there right now with two, three, four units and or you live in a house and you have a basement unit. Totally. It makes total yeah. sense because for them to bring home an extra $5,000 at the end of the year, 
that's a big difference. Yeah. You know what I, mean? I was all fired up to do it. And, and even thinking about some of these new units that I'm taking on, like running them that way. And I just, I don't know. I'm not as sold on it. I think, you know, you've got the right idea to get some institutional longer term bookings. And I yeah. think that can be done in certain areas during like the off market is, you know, maybe you, you increase your, your thing to like, yeah, it's a cheaper rate, but you've got to book four nights or five nights and you get these institutional bookings. I'm um, going to list them for long term, September to April. You are. Okay. And I'm going to list them probably for two grand a month as furnished two bedrooms. Gotcha. Try and, try and get those filled up. So I'm making an extra 500 a month there. One singular lease? Yep. Okay. Fixed term lease for those those months. Furnished, yeah. Uh, for those eight months. And so that'll bring in an extra 500 bucks a month. That's four grand. That effectively covers my furniture cost. Uh, in that long-term lease, and then everything I make over the fifteen hundred bucks during the summertime is gravy. So it's an extra forty-five hundred dollars. And if I can keep that furniture for basically two years, basically I'll net out an extra. It works out to basically being an extra fifteen thousand bucks over two years uh, per unit. Mm. So that that for me, I'd say is worth it. Over twenty-four months, that's almost an extra seven hundred bucks. It works out to me making instead of fifteen hundred, I'm making two grand a month out of these apartments. Mm. I, I think it's worth it. I, again, I probably wouldn't do it if it was for me myself, if I was just me by myself, but where I have a partner that's being the manager. Yeah. Um, and this is on top, again, for her also bringing home an extra yeah, yeah. percentage of, yeah. Of, of, from doing it. I, I think it really, it works out It works out well. So again, yeah. I think it's a very specific Yeah, thing. like these numbers, my numbers change dramatically if that $1,700 management fee is actually going to me and if that $1,500 cleaning fee is actually going to me, then you've got something, but is I can't be doing that. Right, like exactly. Can't be, but that's that's um, the thing. That's that's and that's where a lot of it goes to is the management fees. And so, yeah, this is for an owner operated. I think Airbnb is awesome, uh, but for, for as like a, as a landlord with a bunch of apartments, if it's something you're going to throw under management, not super exciting. I think unless you're in like a crazy downtown location where you can get yeah. crazy rental rates for not even that nice a product, but you're just like summertime you're ballistic like anything around student housing. I'd still recommend it to a big landlord. You do eight month fixed term furnished for the students because you get psychotic rates from the students and then do four months with a manager during the summer and those south end places will make a ton of sense yeah yeah i know that that that's a good model think, there for sure you know yeah. what i mean so cool. interesting you know a couple different takes there um don't forget to like subscribe if you have any comments about short-term rentals we'd love to hear because this is new to us very curious to see how neil feels about this two months in from a few now. months yeah um but yeah thanks uh we good we yeah wrap thanks up. for listening we're gonna rip out here we're doing some work for the real estate group so stay tuned guys There's gonna be some awesome stuff coming out with a release there link will be in the description Thanks so much for watching the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. Don't forget to subscribe. But also check us out on Instagram and TikTok. You can find all the links below. Thanks again for checking us out. When, 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 when I was broke, I had rich habits. Uh. When I was broke, I had rich habits. Uh.